The EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network presents Theology of the Body with your hosts, Father Richard Hogan and Katrina Zeno. Thank you for joining us as we continue this series on Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body. I'm Katrina Zeno, co-founder of Women of the Third Millennium. And I'm Father Richard Hogan, a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis in Minnesota. And with the permission of our Archbishop there, I work full-time with the National Apostolate called Natural Family Planning Outreach of the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. So, Father Hogan, today we're starting in front of the Sacred Heart because we wanted to mention that not only does lust affect, as we said last time, original sin affects sight so that we reduce other people to objects, to just their physical dimension. Or we have a tendency to. We have a tendency to, exactly. That's the consequence of sin. But we also wanted to mention the heart. Right. We were talking last time, as you remember quite well, I'm sure, about original sin and its effects, how it clouded the mind, darkened the will, and disrupted the body. So we're now disintegrated. It's very mm -hmm. difficult for us to act in accordance with that value system. And one of those problems, one of the things that's really hard for us is that we look at um, w men or women, whichever sex we are, the opposite sex, as people to be possessed or taken mm -hmm. because of these inordinate desires that we find it difficult to control. But this isn't just a gaze with the bodily eyes. This is a gaze that comes from the interior. What happens is that the, the physical desires press the will, and the will goes along with it sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's why it's difficult to control. And we actually decide in an interior way to look at someone in an inappropriate way. It's an interior gaze that comes right from the heart. That's why the Lord says it at the one passage that the some of these sins come from deep within a man. It's what comes out of men, which was very hard for the apostles to understand because the whole Jewish tradition was whatever you take in, like the food that you shouldn't eat and so forth. But the Lord turned that around and said, no, it's from the inside out. They come from the deep recesses of the human heart. So these looks that are inappropriate are from the heart, not just from the body or from the physical eyes. And that's why Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in Because he's heart. decided he wants to right. do that within his will. In other words, a man looks at a woman, could be even his wife, and says, you're there for me. Whereas every single human person is there for himself or herself, not as an object to be taken or possessed. I do not own you, I do not possess you, and I should not take you. And while that's a tendency because of this disorder within us stemming from original sin, it still is contrary to the nuptial meaning of the body that we talked about. This uh, meaning that we all know interiorly that the body is to be a gift, that my body is to be a gift to you and to everyone else and yours to, to me and to everyone else. Now, of course, in marriage, it's a very specific thing with, right. with the two people. And, we'll talk and we're not about talking that, that way right, right now, right. obviously. We'll, we'll talk about that eventually, but I think this is so important, especially because I know so many listeners and, and viewers, for instance, are widows or perhaps people who are single. It's so easy to hear what we're saying and think, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm not married. And that's why, although it makes me look a little silly, I like this idea, you know, that I'm a gift. Mm -hmm. That. Um, no matter who I am, what state I find myself, even if I'm a widow, my presence in the world is still as a gift because I still have the nuptial meaning of my body. And it's to be, and the gift is to be expressed in and through the body. But the reason why we are to be a gift is we're created like God and created to act as He acts and then express that in and through the body. Right, exactly. But let's talk about who we are redeemed in Christ because that's really the good news. Right, you know, exactly. The yeah. last show and um, really is kind of the bad news about the man of lust and how we can be tempted to build a civilization of use right rather than the civilization of love right and right. the pope has always said you know it's a civilization of love and a culture of life that he exhorts us to build but we can't do that without the redemption of christ he christ did not accuse the human person he's not saying you're doing this and you better stop that's not the sense of christ well, at all. he can feel that way sometimes he can he the lord is appealing mm -hmm. and he's saying look now you don't have to exist in this disordered state you're called to something better. You know you're called to something better because you retain this understanding that you are to be a gift even in and through your body, what the Pope calls the nuptial meaning. That value system is still there. Christ appeals to that 
And you might respond and say, well, I can't do that. I've got this problem called original sin. I'm crippled. It's not possible for me to function that way. And Christ says, oh, yes, it is because of my grace. That's what, wonderful good what news, What St. Paul isn't it? said, you know, my grace is sufficient for you, or what the Lord said to St. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul was complaining to the Lord that he had this wound. We're not sure what it was, whether it was a temptation, whether it was a physical disability of some kind, whether it was an emotional or psychological problem. We're not sure what it was. But Paul was praying and saying, Lord, take this away from me so I can do your work. And the Lord responded, my grace is sufficient. And so the, the Lord is appealing, but he's not leaving us crippled. He's giving us the grace that makes it possible. Not necessarily easy, but possible. Right. It would have been easy in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> right. And so now to do this, to tease out this understanding of the redemption of the body, that's really what he's saying. We're going to talk about the body being redeemed in Christ. Let me pull something else out have here. Another prop I still have another prop. This is my ping pong pal. My ping pong ball. Too bad I didn't bring two of them. Then we could have hit the ball back and forth. But when I, I, I read this section over and over and over again, trying to understand what the Pope was doing, because it's different. In the, the other sections, he very often just takes one scripture and uses that as a springboard. But in this section, I call it Pauline ping pong, because what the Pope is doing is he's ping ponging back and forth from eight different scriptures in Paul. So it can get a little confusing sometimes, but I think if you remember, his purpose is to help us understand how grace operates actually in the body. You know, we're body, soul, persons. This is not just about the soul getting to heaven. This is about the body being redeemed and that body and that spirit being reconnected, even on earth now. It's to reconstitute what was broken. Uh, if, if by original sin there was a constitutive break within the human person so that the mind and will no longer uh, was a, the, the thoughts of the mind and the choices of the will were not expressed by the body the way they should be. We only will be fully restored in the resurrection uh, of the, the body last, at the end of time. Right. But, but that doesn't mean we have to live under the subject of sin now, does no, it? No, right, exactly. No, that's what grace does. And grace, of course, is in the soul. It's a, it's a, a, a form of the soul, so to speak. But the, the, the union of soul and body, because of grace, is more together than it would be without grace. And so with grace, then, it is possible for the mind and will to know the truth and to love as, as, as the will life. should mm -hmm. and then express that in through the body. Pope has a beautiful phrase once again. He calls it purity of heart. Exactly. That that's yeah. what we're called to recapture is this purity of heart because purity leads to freedom. Now, in our culture, we have a real misunderstanding of freedom. Oh, I don't know. Don't you like <laughs> what, what the Supreme Court says about freedom? <laughs> Freedom in, in, in our culture in the United States today, and whenever anybody thinks of the U.S., and I think many people around the world do on occasion, um, freedom means that I, as a person, can do anything I wish, anytime I want, with no holes barred, no restrictions whatsoever, no penalties for whatever I do, or at least not very many. And this idea of freedom is not exactly the way uh, the theologians of the church or the Gospels have thought about it. Nor Christ. Nor Christ. No, right. it isn't. Yeah. So this is a very important topic, this topic of freedom. So please stay with us, and when we return, we'll continue talking about true freedom and false freedom. Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, 
because he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done great things to me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is from generation unto generations to them that fear him. He hath shown might with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the conceit of their heart. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the lowly. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. He hath received Israel his servant, being mindful of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Amen. We now return to Theology of the Body on EWTN Radio. Welcome back. We're continuing our series on Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body, and we're talking about freedom. And in our culture, freedom often means being able to do whatever I want, whenever I want. With no consequences With no whatsoever. consequences. And we've seen this even in some uh, Supreme Court decisions, haven't we? Right. There's the famous Casey decision of the United States Supreme Court in 1992. Casey was the governor of Pennsylvania, uh, a great pro-life hero and a Democratic governor. In other words, he was in the Democratic Party, which is pretty unusual these days anyway. But um, he was elected to the state office, the state house in Pennsylvania. And the legis legislature in Pennsylvania, while he was governor, passed a mildly restrictive abortion law. I think it was parental notification. In other words, anyone younger than 21 had to have a parental signature in order to obtain an abortion. And uh, the Planned Parenthood of Pennsylvania sued the, the state, naming the governor as defendant, which is the normal way of doing things when you sue a state. Okay. And it wound its way through the courts and got to the United States Supreme Court in June of 92. And the court threw out the Pennsylvania law, claimed it was unconstitutional. But that was not the most important aspect of that decision. The most important aspect of that decision was a line in that in the majority decision. Now, there were actually three opinions written, but the only one that really counts is the majority one. Right, and this there was, was written by the Supreme Court. Well, by five of the justices. Right, that's what I meant. There was, there was a majority decision, I think, written by five. There was a concurring opinion, meaning two more justices agreed, but for different reasons. And there was a dissent uh, from, I think, two that said we disagree with the decision. But the majority decision had this one line in it, and it says, incredibly, quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Now, I'll repeat that because it's so spectacularly it's, stupid. It's that incredible it's, <laughs> to think that yeah, this is actually we, in print. Right. Not only in print, Katrina, but it's the supreme law of the land for all Americans. And, of course, the Supreme Court has incredible influence beyond our shores with other governments. Right. They said, at the heart of liberty... Meaning at the heart of freedom. Right. Liberty is a technical term in American law because Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, used it in the Declaration of Independence, that famous line, you know, that liberty... And, and freedom and um, pursuit of happiness and so on, that phrase there. So liberty is a technical term. The Supreme Court used it in this quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of human life. You see, Katrina, you're free because God made you that way. And because you're free, says the court, you can define existence. You want to levitate this table here or make the pictures bigger or something. You can, you can define the world. Existence. According to what I prefer. Right. Mm -hmm. Meaning the universe and the mystery of human life. So you can define my life. You can say I have a right to exist or I don't because you're free. In other words, everyone has total and absolute control. Whatever they want, they simply decree and it happens. They're all God. That sounds like a recipe for disaster, for anarchy. If well, I decide what's best, because what intrigues me is they, they don't, they, is that they say it has the right. So they're using this kind of rights language to say that it's my inherent, inalienable right to decide what's meaningful, to decide existence, to decide whether or not you should even live. Live, right. And doesn't that just open the door? Oh, of course. For you know, my dad had a saying when he didn't like the way someone was driving in front of him. Uh, he, dad used to say, well, he bought the road the other day. Well, to take that phrase, with this decision, 
with this line, he wouldn't even have to buy it. He just declared it's his by royal decree or something. And then that road's his, and no one has the right to drive on that highway or that road unless Dad gave him permission. Of course, what if a semi-driver decided, 18-wheeler, mm -hmm. yeah, decided, well, it was his road, and my dad's driving a little VW bug. He didn't, but let's say he was. And you got the semi-driver, and you got the VW driver. And what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Right. <laughs> In other words, might makes right. In yeah. other words, whoever has the most power would obviously be able to make his decrees or her decrees the ones that the rest of us have to live by, which is really a dictatorship or a, a tyranny. And it actually ends up taking away the very thing they're trying to defend because it, it, it takes away freedom. Now, one has to qualify that a bit. Mm -hmm you can't ever take away a person's freedom it's interior to the person short of uh, even killing them doesn't take it away because the soul is on but you can take away the options mm -hmm. to the point where the exercise of freedom becomes almost meaningless right. and so this this line setting up a dictatorship would eventually limit freedom even though they're trying to defend it now the reason why that's in that Casey decision is because it was the only way to defend the killing of the unborn because you see by 1992 it was pretty clear that these little children had all of the genetic material that they would have later on that they were just as much a person then as they would be later on right. and the only way to say that we're going to be able to take their lives is to say we can define the mystery of life right. that's why it's in there but as a principle of law it's just awful it, it trashes the declaration of independence because what does it mean that we are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, if each one of us can define the mystery of life. So it, it eliminates any kind of understanding in any normal reading of it, of the Declaration of Independence. And even worse, even worse, is that this line actually buys the lies of Satan in the Garden of Eden. You know, you'd think that the Supreme Court justices would be more informed than this. But they bought, literally, the oldest lie in the book. Which is? You can know good and evil. You can have it your way. And decide it for you, myself. So, yeah, mm -hmm. if you want, you want the, those, those paintings to levitate, just say so. If you want the stones to be bread, just say so. If you want to eat chocolate all day without ever putting on a pound, ever running a tooth, ever um, getting, running out, ever getting full, just say so. Well, you know, once again, I think John Paul II has very well diagnosed what's going on because in his um, encyclical, The Splendor of Truth, he has a great line that I'd like to quote. He says, certain currents of modern thought have gone so far as to exalt freedom to such an extent that it becomes an absolute, which would then be the source of values. And isn't that exactly what we it's see exactly in the what, Casey decision? Exactly. Right? And that's what most people mean by freedom. And that's the exact, almost the exact opposite of what the church has always meant by freedom. What the church means by freedom is that we are free to do what we should do, that is to say, to act like God. That's why this purity of heart that St. Paul talks about and John Paul II highlights in the second part of this second cycle is really something that establishes freedom. Not the license, which is what really the Casey decision is talking license about. License meaning I can do whatever I, I want, want whenever, whenever I, I want. want. Mm -hmm. Rather, it is the fact that we can choose to do what we're created for. Not because it's it's bad to do the other things, although it is. It's well, it's harmful. Well, at, it's least, harmful. at least some of them are pretty bad. Mm -hmm. But because this is the only way that we fulfill ourselves, that we become more like God. Right. If we're created like God, then the best thing for us is to act like him and the more we act like him the more like him we become and since we're free because he created us free that's what Jefferson says mm -hmm. in the declaration he says we are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights that among these rights are liberty life and the pursuit of happiness actually he puts life first and then liberty and pursuit of happiness which is rather important but the, the point is that even Jefferson, who was uh, at least agnostic, uh, admitted in that founding document that liberty comes from God. So we have freedom because we're like God. And it stands to reason that the more you act like God, 
the more like God you will become and the freer you will exactly, become. Exactly, which is kind of the opposite of what we're hearing. Exactly. We're hearing the more that you push God on the periphery, get him off to the side, the more absolute my freedom can become, then the more free I will be. Whereas John Paul II is always so careful. He always links freedom with love. To me, this was such an important insight that freedom can never be an absolute, that freedom is always in the service of love because that's what we're created to be, to make this gift of myself. You mean if I hold a gun, load a gun to your head and say, love me, that's not love? <laughs> no, it's not love because you're not making a gift of yourself to me. You're coercing me. I'm coercing you. That's exactly and that's not love. Right. No. And see, freedom is given to us. You're exactly right for the sake of love. God valued love to such an extent that he made us with free will. But because without freedom, we cannot love. Freedom is required for love. Animals do not love because they don't have free will. Holding a gun to your head is not love. Shotgun weddings are not acknowledged in the church or in the civil law as valid marriages because they're not a free gift. Love requires freedom. But once you give, give freedom to a being and make them persons, then they are free not to love. So God risked his rejection. God risks sin. God risks the evil of sin, which is represented particularly by the cross of Christ and how awful that was. God risks all that for the sake of love, and we can see then how important love is to God. It is very important, and the redemption of the body, as the Pope tells us, is life in the spirit. In other words, it's receiving back the spirit that we forfeited in the garden, and so the, the redemption of the body is that the Spirit of Christ comes back to dwell within me. Once again, I'd like to quote what the Holy Father says in Theology of the Body. He says, The fruit of redemption is the Holy Spirit who dwells in man and in his body as a temple. So the Pope is developing with, in this Pauline ping-pong, going back and forth from these different scriptures, this holiness of the body, the fact that the Holy Spirit dwells within me. It restores to me a type of purity, a type of unity between body and spirit. So that then I again act as an image of God. And that, of course, means love, and love means freedom, understood in the proper sense. And when, when the Holy Father, as you well know, talks about this Holy Spirit dwelling within us, he's really talking in very classical Catholic mm. terms. This is the, uh, the, the idea of the, the soul being the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is the older classical language. It's the idea of grace and with, that comes with baptism. That's really all he's saying here, that with baptism we receive sanctifying grace, we're deified, we're made into literally gods because we have the life of the Trinity within us. And along with that grace life comes the indwelling of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the, the, the gift of grace has always in Catholic thought been attributed to the third person of the Trinity, to the Holy Spirit. Just as creation is attributed to the Father and redemption to the Son, sanctification or the blessing of this divine life within us, given primarily through the sacraments and beginning with baptism, is the work of the Holy Spirit. So the grace life is what enables us to act as we should and express that in and through the body. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is within us along with that grace. I remember It's very classical. It is very classic, which is wonderful, because it's what we've said, is that the Pope isn't interested in throwing everything out. He's interested in standing on the shoulders of those who have come before and articulating it in a new way for this generation, for this uh, time in history. And I remember Father Michael Scanlon one time saying, the function of the Holy Spirit... Or that is to make us holy. Yeah, That's right, why he's yeah, called yeah. the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And for some reason, until he said that, that had never clicked for me. But that's what you're saying, is that the Holy Spirit dwelling within us makes us holy, sanctifies us, sanctifies the body. Well, sanctifies the soul, and then through the soul, the body. The body, so course, that we yeah. become, right. Because we're one body. being. Right. You know, we're, not, we're not, you know... Uh, crackers and milk or something. The body and soul are one. It, right. It, it's a, it's a, un, a unit, um, not a unit, but uh, a union of body and spirit flesh, within us. Flesh and spirit, mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you for joining us again today as we've been speaking about the redemption of the body and Christ bringing the Holy Spirit to us. Please join us next time as we continue this series on Pope John Paul II's Theology of the Body. You've been listening to Theology of the Body with Father Richard Hogan and Katrina Zeno on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network.